12. So you remember what happened at the church is suffering a lot of persecution right now. It's early on. Uh, you know, I don't know, the first few years of the church. Saul has been saved. And at this time, excuse me, they're still calling him Saul. He hadn't been, he hadn't been named Paul yet. But the church is scattered. It's scattered. You remember, God always uses whatever circumstances you're in to use the church. So the church is getting persecuted. They start, start scattering out and uh, going to different places. And what happens then? Everywhere they go, they start spreading the good news. So the Lord knew how to spread them out. And that, that meant, you know, they had to get out their comfort zones and... Uh, I'm just thinking, I don't, I don't know what the future holds for the church in America, but do not be surprised if that day comes for us where, where the Lord uh, nudges us out of our comfort zone and we, we face trouble and, and we find out what Christians are going to stand and what, who are, who are going to you know, just go along with the flow. In fact, a lot of them have fell off real easy into it right now. I could show you plenty, plenty of examples right now. I, I saw, I was looking at something today in uh, uh, Katy, Texas, of a, a church there, supposed to be a Christian church. And they got a closet where children who are considering being trans and all that kind of stuff can go in there and pick stuff out to help them, and, and they don't tell the parents. So uh, there's, a, there's a secret video of it. Somebody recorded it. So, you know, we have a lot of churches right now calling themselves Christian churches that they don't believe the Bible at all. So, that could lead to other things. We're not going to, I tell you, we're, as long as I'm here, we're not going along with anything that disputes God's Word in such a way. But, uh, and I know y'all ain't going to go along with it either. If y'all thought like that, y'all wouldn't be here tonight. But, uh, all right. Oh, yeah. Well, they're, they're fixing to be in big uh, hot, hot, cold water this winter in Europe because of their decisions they made about gas and nuclear and coal and all that kind of stuff. So I predict by the end of next year they'll be turning all that stuff back on again because you know, you can't just cut stuff off and turn it back on at the drop of a hat. It's like, it's like at the paper mill. I worked in the power plant, you know, and and uh, once you lose everything, you got to, it, you don't just go in and hit a button and fire everything off. It's a process, and it's going to be the same thing with them. All right, James. I mean James, Acts chapter twelve. So while this was going on. And uh, it says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. This is not the same Herod that was around, uh, you know, when Jesus was born, remember? We had all the children and under two years, males under two years of age uh, massacred. This is, I'm not sure if it's his son or his grandson. I'm thinking it's actually his grandson. But I could be wrong about that. But anyhow, the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This is during the days of unleavened bread. In other words, Passover time. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So he saw it please the Jews when he killed James, a brother of John, 
James and John and all that stuff. This, this James, he died by the sword. And so he locked Peter up too. He kept in prison. Uh, but keep this part about the earnest prayer. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Remember that part right there. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. I love this part right here. Does Peter seem like he was worried? <laughs> he was sound asleep. The angel probably said, Peter, Peter, come on, let's go. He would wake up, so he slapped him on the side and said, Come on, let's go. So that just shows me Peter was at peace. Lord, that I could be like that all the time, too. Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. So, uh, and he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And he said, I'm dreaming. This can't be real. When they had passed the first and second guard, I love this. They just walked right on by him. Uh, when they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gates leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street and immediately... The angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So this is this is where they were gathered together and praying here, right? And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open up the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. She just took off. She was so excited. They said to her, you are out of your mind. Now, wait a minute. Weren't they just praying for Peter to be freed? And they tell this poor little servant girl, you know, after she sees him and runs off without opening the door, said, you're out of your mind. Do you ever, have you ever experienced an answer to prayer where you kind of thought in the same way? You know, you've been praying for this and praying for this, suddenly it happens, you're like, no way. You know, but God does answer prayers. You know, he, he answers, he answers our prayers. And all of you. All of you have experienced that. You've all experienced it. Many times. Many times. And so God, God heard them. They told her, you out of your mind. But, uh, but she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel. They figured this is a guardian angel. But they still didn't believe it could be Peter. But Peter, he's still standing at the door, continued knocking. He's still knocking at the door. And uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Uh, this was James, the brother of the half-brother of Jesus who he's talking about. Tell this James, because the other James was dead. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Can you imagine that? I noticed that uh, Luke, he likes to, he likes to uh, uh, talk like that. There was no little disturbance. Uh, man, you know, it was like a, uh, you kicked a hill of, uh, of fire ants there, I bet you. They go wild. Now, now, he was in chains. He had a guard sleeping by him. He had two standing in front of the, the, the cell. 
And there were two more guard stations before he could get out the gate. And he ain't here. How could that possibly happen? Nothing's been tore up. The gate's standing open. You know, if I was in charge of all that, I would be furious with the men because there's no way an angel comes in and pops his restraints and, and just opens the gates and lets them out and nobody sees them. They're supposed to be standing there guarding them. Would anybody believe that somehow they hadn't been corrupted? No. Nope. And somebody of Herod's mindset surely ain't. When the day came, there was no little disturbance amongst, among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. And you can best believe that's exactly what happened to him. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So uh, he went to Caesarea because that's kind of a, a good, cool spot. The temperature was lower there. You got a lot of sea breezes. So that's why he went to Caesarea. But anyhow, before, before we get through with the rest of this, does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? Got any comments? So would the guards have just been like blinded to the fact that you walked out? Or I don't know. That's just the Holy Spirit working right there. Supernatural. Yeah. That's just the Holy Spirit working right there. That's right. Exactly. It's just like <clears throat> I was reading about a, one of them people in the communist countries or something. I think it, who was that? I think it was Richard Wormbrandt. His wife was trying to escape or something with her children, and it was communist. So they get in this line of cars, and she's got Bibles all in the back or something going into another place. So the cars are getting, all these cars are getting searched by these sentries. And uh, she finally gets her turn to drive up there, you know, with all these Bibles in the back, and gets up there to the sentry. And, he just waves them through. And then she looks back, and the next car comes up. They start searching it. That's just the, the grace and provision of God right there. So that's what happened with her. And uh, so, yeah, God, he can do anything he wants. I ain't worried about it. And if he chooses to just make that hurricane fizzle out in the Gulf, he can do that too. And, uh, all right. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. So me, uh, Herod apparently had a, uh, he had a very persuasive speaking voice. And, uh, you know, we have, we have a lot of preachers that are really good at speaking, and, and I'm not knocking that. They're very interesting to listen to. They have a presence that God uses, I'm not knocking it in no way. But don't trust, just because somebody knows how to get up and speak in front of public, don't mean you should believe them or trust them. Uh, uh, just for an example, Adolf Hitler. He had an entire nation mesmerized. If you ever watch some of his speeches, it's very authoritative and, and he, he had a guttural way of talking and a rough way of talking, very powerful public speaker. Uh, and the people, they, they would just cheer for him and just go crazy in his presence, you know, and even people swooning, you know, you know, in his presence when he drive by in a car or something like that. But that was not the Holy Spirit doing that. And I can tell you that right now. If you ever listen to him, his speeches sound demonic. And uh, so this guy here, Herod, he was a great speaker. 
Uh, and I've heard people say that the garment he was wearing was a very shimmery garment that would catch the light. So he's up here speaking. He's got a way with words. Everybody can hear him. He's got on this shimmery garment. Well, don't, don't, be, uh, don't underestimate the ability of people to be hoodwinked. Because, see, they're seeing all this, and this guy, he's like a god. He is a god. Yeah, look look at the light flashing off of him. And his words are so powerful and persuasive. Let me just say that the Antichrist is going to be the same way. And people are going to fall for him by the multitudes. By, by millions. Millions upon millions, if not billions. Because he's going to have a... He's going to have access to the entire world. And he said, the voice of a God and not a man. And it says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Well, let's, let me just oops, show you something about that lovely part about the eaten by worms. Did he immediately die? I, I don't know. It says he was immediately struck down. I don't think that means he immediately died. But uh, let me just tell you what. Uh, huh? Yeah, that's what I think. I think he was struck down. He probably had a stroke or something. Lord probably put a stroke on him and he, he went down. And uh, uh, let me read you this article. It's, it's over 10 years old. But it says, he was a ruthless man who died a miserable death. More than 2,000 years after Herod the Great succumbed at age 69, doctors have now settled on exactly what killed the king of ancient Judea. Chronic kidney disease complicated by a very uncomfortable case of maggot-infested gangrene <clears throat> and I just, you know, I'm going to go on and read it, of the genitals. The clues of Herod's diagnosis were listed in ancient history books, and according to Jan Hirschman, the lead diagnosing doctor in the case, included intense itching, painful intestinal problems, breathlessness, convulsions in every limb, and gangrene of the genitals. It was a rare, uh, uh, it was a rare affliction. Uh, they said it all began with probably con uh, from things they've seen uh, from a, a chronic kidney disease. And there is a, a rare condition called Fournier's gangrene. And so he had a, he, he had a bad case of worms. I hate it when that happens. Yeah. God said, don't play with me. Uh, and their diagnosis, he probably also had gonorrhea. Uh, and just, uh, it could have caused urine to leak inside his body, spreading bacteria. He was basically uh, rotting while he was still alive. Now, can we just move on past that now? Is that okay? Y'all okay with it? But it wasn't pretty. But let me tell you, that was not karma. That was the judgment of God on that man. Yep. Yep. That's right. He was not a good man. And, 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 uh, yeah. They're saying, that's right. Yeah. And now he was struck down right there while he was before him. Whether he had a stroke or whatever, uh, you know, any uh, all those kidney symptoms, they, I could see where they could cause something like that or bacteria or infection. All of a sudden, his body gets overwhelmed. All of a sudden, he just collapses. I, I can see where that would happen, and it has happened with many people. But uh, but anyhow, enough of that. <laughs> Verse 24, he says, But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. 
which is the same Mark that uh, uh, wrote the Gospel of Mark that I read from this morning. The same guy. He was a very young man at the time. Uh, and I'm just going to read the first three verses here in chapter 13. We're going to save the rest for later. It says, Now they were in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. So this is this is a guy right here, Manan, who had been saved and had been a friend of Herod. So that's a man that was saved and was in this crew right here. Uh, Simeon, who was called Niger, was probably a black man from Africa, the area of Niger. Uh, and then you got Barnabas. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now I'm going to tell you, the church was not very old at this time, but you see this church in Antioch, they knew how to be led by the Lord. They knew how. That was by praying and fasting and one accord, and they were, do, and, uh, they were doing it together. That's why I like to say so much about prayer meetings on Wednesday night. Or, or here, now, or whenever. Because it's so, it's so important in the life of a church. And, and it's such an encouragement. It, it's so important in the life of a church. Pray at home, and, or you should pray at home. Of course, you should pray by yourself, of course. But don't ever forget the church this is a body, a, a, uh, the hands and feet in Christ. This church was put here in this community right here yes. for us to pray for our community. Pray. Ask God, what can we do? And then pray about it. Let God show us. Don't just say, hey, we're going to start this new program. We done, me and one or two others, we done talked about it, and this is what we're going to do. And uh, not never pray about it, not never uh, consult about it, not ever ask how we're going to do it. Just go out there and do it. And, and I ain't got nothing against programs or, you know, we get stuff from the uh, convention all the time about these new initiatives and all that. I'm good with all that. But pray. Pray. Is this what God wants our church to be involved in? That's why it's so important. He said, then they laid their hands on them and, and sent them off. Uh, I'll tell you something that really got off of me one time. We were going on a mission trip to Boston. First time we had, and, and I, I'm not saying anything behind her back, that I didn't tell him when we got back. I said something to all the deacons. I was a deacon at the time. I said something to all of them about it. We left and went on that mission trip, and the Sunday before we left, they didn't give us a send-off. They didn't say, come up here, let's pray for y'all as you go to work for the Lord in, in, the, in this city far away and all that. There was nothing. No announcement, no nothing. And I thought, I just felt like it was on us and the church really didn't have nothing to do with it. And that's kind of a bad feeling in a way. The church needs to be involved in all that kind of stuff. That don't mean everybody can go, you know. Sometimes everybody can't go. But if you send people out of your church to go on any kind of mission trip, even if it's just like to Columbus or something like that, you need to get a send-off and prayers from your church family because they are a big part of it. I mean, they, you know, it's... It's, uh, it's all of us supposed to be together. And that's a big problem in the church in America today, in individual churches, because everybody ain't always on board with everything. And this is the Lord's work that he's called us to do. 
Amen? Amen. All right. Anybody have anything else? That's right. One accord. Yeah. Pray together with one accord about whatever you're praying for. It's supernatural things That's right. And I know there can be differences of opinion about how it should be done. And uh, that's why you need to plan so much ahead of time, you know. And you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. You need you need to just not go in it, you know, like uh, like children. You need to go in it like people who've got sense, and you know, so you don't get so you don't get messed up because it's difficult enough. Just like the trip to Uganda last year, now, it wasn't none of his fault, but there were some people supposed to be helping get all that stuff in order. And you go to a country like that, a foreign country, you better have your ducks in a row. Well, something come up about his passport. Uh, what was his name? Terry Bell. Terry Bell was supposed to be going. Yeah. Well, at the last minute, in fact, he was already, I don't know, New York or wherever they left out from. Amsterdam. Amst he was in Amsterdam. That's even worse. And found out that his, no, he found out his passport had expired. He had to come home. You better make sure you got your ducks in a row when you do something like that. And I thought, I thought when uh, we went into Bangalore in India that I was going to get expelled because uh, I was telling we was there to uh, visit a friend, which we were, and we we're going to help a lady missionary that lived over there and and, uh, and you know see the sights in the country. Well, the woman that was checking me in, she just couldn't believe somebody would want to be a tourist in uh, Bangalore. Which uh, I will say, there ain't much reason to be. But uh, and and she gave me a hard time. I said, well, I'm fixing to have to go to the house and leave Brendan and our friend there, you know. But we worked it out, and I got through. So you need to have your ducks in a row, and you need to do go about it in an adult, mature way about how you handle it. And like I say, it wasn't Terry's fault. Somebody from another church was supposed to be handling all that, and they they messed up. But anyhow, my main point is we need to all be in one accord and we make plans to do mission trips or and I'm talking about mission trips in the community yes. or in the state or in the nation or even overseas. We need to be in one accord and we need to support each other. And I'll say this too, in a, without sounding kind of grasping, we need to support each other in prayer and we need to support each other, the people that are going. We need to support them financially. Yes. I'm not saying, you know, pay to put them up in a five-star hotel or nothing like that, but help. Don't, don't let them people that do that bear all the burden of it. Because I see that a lot. I see that a lot. Uh, people having to do these mission trips in the name of their church, and they pay every penny on their own. Yeah. That's all right, though. I'm not complaining about that. We we did what the Lord wanted us to do. And uh, that's just the way it ought to be. That's the way it ought to be. And as I say that, I can tell you right now, there's going to be some kind of mission trip this next year from this church. I hope we can get people to go, but, but it's going to happen some way or another. I think, I think it'll last. Yeah, I'm sure you would. Yeah. Let's go to let's go to them fun, comfortable places. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody got anything else? It's got to be one accord. Just like Harry Truman said, too. God's going to bless the church on one That's court. right. He's going to bless that. And, and like Harry Truman said, you can do just about anything and nobody cares who gets the credit. That's right. 
I don't care. <laughs> I don't. You know, I want to give credit to where it's due. Anyhow, y'all, if, if anybody got anything else, y'all, uh, uh, y'all, y'all remember Carolyn? She's having a procedure done Tuesday. Uh, yeah, remember we got we got food over there at the annex that needs to be eaten immediately, don't we? <laughs> they had a shower there this afternoon, so we got a bunch of finger foods. All right. Oh yeah, baby. Yes. And uh. Fruit tray, vegetable tray. I I also just I also just want to say, and I don't I don't mean to. I hope it doesn't embarrass her, but I, I tell y'all how happy and thankful I am for Morgan that, uh, yes. that she's come to be yes. with. And, and she yes. told me this morning uh, she misunderstood that she wants to join our church next Sunday. She was going to come down this morning, but she she wasn't sure she understood. So so uh, uh, I gotta I gotta do better on my explaining, I guess. But uh, yeah, but uh, so. Y'all continue to pray for her and Aaron and their family. Yes. Lord, lift them up. Yes. And, uh, and, yes. and so as we leave, I'm going to get Mr. Carlos to close us out. And if you will, uh, bless the food too. So that way I can run right on through the door and <laughs> start causing stuff to happen. <laughs> All right. Amen. Yeah.